by since COVID before we get this right, but um, it looks like it's working. So um, I'm David Nauman. I'm uh, a surgeon in Birmingham, uh, but I also have an interest in um, blood and resuscitation, as I'm sure we all do. Um, and uh, that was what my PhD was about. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some whole blood transfusion for combat casualties. Oh, I should say I, I'm also in the military. Um, I'm a deployable general surgeon um, for the military. Um, I am going to keep the Q&A kind of tab open on my screen. Um, so if you want to ask a question, uh, you know, at any time, please just type it in there. I will try and um, catch it and then answer it verbally um, as we go. Um, if I don't see it or I'm too engrossed in my own um, uh, self, then I, I, I may just have to wait till the end. Um, so I hope that's all right. Um, I, I, um, I'll try my best. Okay. So we've got to start, start off really talking about um, war injuries and how this is different because um, this isn't just to talk about whole blood um, in trauma. This is really about war injuries as well. And these are different to the ones you might see in the civil, civilian um, arena. And I was just watching all the names of the people coming into the room and, and I can see there's quite a few military here uh, and quite a lot of civilians. Um, so, um, uh, but I'm sure you all appreciate that war injuries have traditionally been a combination of blast, uh, fragment and gunshot wounds. So um, essentially penetrating trauma. There certainly are blunt injuries in war, you know, um, uh, you know, a rollover vehicle or RTC falls, all those sorts of things. But we're talking about predominantly quite high injury severity and polytrauma. Uh, the, the, um, there's been lots of papers about the signature patterns of injury and in Afghanistan and Iraq which are kind of the, the most prominent um, uh, wars recently in the literature uh, the the signature injuries were, was the IED the improvised explosive device um, stepping on top of one of those and it blowing up and um, taking off one or two of the legs with a pelvic fracture and perhaps some some torso injuries as well so we're talking about very severe injuries um, we're also talking about situations that are not friendly. Um, there needs to be evacuation under fire and there are resource constraints. Um, you know, uh, you people on the front line have a peer to peer radio contact, but not really um, much above that. And uh, and so it, it's really quite a difficult and scary arena in which to uh, find yourself either injured or looking after an injured patient. It's very isolated and lonely out there. Um, and also, I should add at the bottom here, which is even more relevant for the future and, and well present, uh, that uh, unfortunately we're targeted by unscrupulous forces, and that includes medical uh, people and uh, perhaps even especially medical people. So war injuries are, um, are, uh, are you know, on the upper scale of what you probably have seen in a civilian um, arena. So th this is an image used um, with consent from Bastion. Uh, many of you know Camp Bastion uh, Medical Facility. This patient has one of those signature injuries. It's come in with, um, with uh, bilateral lower limb injuries, um, horrific uh, uh, um, sort of mutilation and a bit of uh, upper limb injuries. And uh, this patient also needed a laparotomy. So uh, you all know this, uh, but it's important just to have this as a baseline. Uh, and I'll come back to this slide a couple of times. So damage control resuscitation, it, it's really important to have the priorities here. And these are in order really. So priority number one must be to stop the bleeding. And although I'm talking about whole blood today and blood products and transfusion, it's really the most important part is to stop the bleeding. And then comes hemostatic resuscitation. Um, and, uh, and I include with that blood products approximating whole blood. And we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. And then most importantly for damage control resuscitation, we are talking about the restoration of physiology and not anatomy. So you can ignore the, uh, the, the, the uh, mutilation of the body uh, just, just for a bit um, and concentrate on keeping the patient alive. And I'm sure you all understand the concepts of damage control uh, that uh, isn't, you can't do anything with a, with a perfectly fixed dead patient. Um, so you need to get that patient uh, across the line uh, to a point which you can use definitive care. This is important because um, Blood products may come first in the damage control resuscitation pathway, but that does not mean that they're the first priority. 
And that's an important thing to uh, get your head around because it's very, very easy to think that um, the priorities are all the same order that you give things to your patient, but that's not the case. The quicker you can stop the bleeding, the better. And um, all this stuff I'm talking about for the next half hour is all just decoration uh, until you can do that, really. By the way, I, I might say some controversial things, so just chip in with the Q&A um, to challenge me. Um, so we, we have to think about a timeline from damage control resuscitation to definitive care. And this does go, this is a, this is a timeline, sometimes faster than others. Um, if you've got a not very physiologically poorly patient, you can go almost straight to definitive care. But if you've got someone with um, all that classic triad of hypothermia, acidosis and um, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, coagulopathy, um, and then insert into that um, probably a bit of hyperkalemia uh, and hypocalcemia. If you have all five of those things, you're in deep trouble and um, you need to restore the physiology first. So part of giving whole blood and blood product resuscitation and all the good stuff in damage control resuscitation is all about starting off empirical and, and evolving or, or kind of moving into a bespoke phase of care. So in your empirical um, phase, that is about algorithms and guidelines, which have been worked out to be the greatest good for most people, and they target the physiology. So these are not tailor made approaches for your patient. These are, these are rules, if you will, um, or uh, basic um, general treatments you give to everyone in order to um, treat them as best you can. And those are based on best evidence. Then you move over to bespoke treatment. And this includes precision care. This includes using TEG and Rotem, uh, giving people the, the products they need, plasma, platelets, calcium, all that good stuff, um, but doing it in a targeted fashion. And that is where you start to restore their anatomy as well, and you have a more targeted approach. So when we're talking about whole blood resuscitation, when we're talking about massive transfusion, we're really talking about this first bit, this empirical treatment, and what is the best treatment for this phase? So that is our whole blood um, bit there. Whole blood certainly does come into the bespoke uh, part of the pathway, um, but, uh, but really um, the, the, where, it, where it sort of uh, earns its uh, wages is in that empirical bit. And going back to war injuries again, combat casualties uh, uh, have, an, have had traditionally an enormous amount of blood products, you know, um, crazy amounts uh, uh, repeatedly. And that's because of the burden of injury is so great and the, the amount of blood lost ha has been significant. So these types of patients, war injured, uh, massive bleeding, are going to require um, a large component of their care in that empirical part during evacuation, during the, uh, the movement from the, from the point of injury in the battle space into uh, the, uh, the field hospital and onwards. So some of you have probably seen um, the TCC guidelines. These are from America, from the Joint Trauma System, and they have put a hierarchy of um, what you should use if you have it uh, for hemostatic resuscitation. So right up at the top there, they've got low titer um, O uh, stored whole blood, which we'll talk about in just a minute. They've also got just underneath that, if you don't have the stored whole blood, uh, to have fresh whole blood, and we'll talk about the difference between those in just a minute. And then if you don't have those, then component therapy, this is what we're used to, perhaps more in the UK. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the kind of traditional one to one to one um, plasma red blood cells and platelets. And it's, and it's pretty obvious that that is uh, designed to uh, approximate whole blood. As you all know, um, we, uh, the whole blood cycle um, as sort of has, has done a full cycle in that we were giving a lot of whole blood during earlier wars, such as this World War II. Um, we then started to um, make components for essentially for transfusing to people uh, after surgery or who have cancer, leukemia, all those sorts of things. And you can, you know, you can uh, a one pa patient, one person donates a unit of blood and they can treat lots of different patients. But for trauma, we now want to reapproximate those. And that's where whole blood has come into its, um, into its own here. Then the TCC says, if you don't have platelets, just give plasma and red blood cells. And then plasma and red blood cells alone is right at the bottom there. And, um, and so notice that um, crystalloid is nowhere to be seen. 
um, in that hierarchy. Um, that is a debate for another time. Um, some of you know I was an investigator in the refill study, um, and there probably is a place for crystalloid, but that's about all I'm going to say in this presentation. So is it, 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 we have to make it clear what we're talking about with whole blood. Whole blood is not just one thing. Okay, there is stored whole blood and there is fresh whole blood. And it's really important to um, understand what you're talking about when you're and what you're reading about when you're reading these studies. So stored whole blood is kind of the whole blood version of what we kind of already know. So it's collected and stored um, and it's, it's, um, it's just as safe as our normal traditional component therapy because it's, it's had the chance to be tested and to be, um, uh, you know, have all the, uh, the, the guidelines and algorithms, everything's followed um, down to the T. Um, it, it's, it's not um, collected and delivered in an emergency. It's, it's, it's a controlled collection and testing. However, um, over time, there is a dec decrease in clotting factors and, and platelets start to not really work. In fact, um, they might not work at all after a while. Um, so, uh, so really, is it whole blood? I mean, this is a philosophical question. Um, it's, it's as best you can do if you're storing something at the moment. Fresh whole blood is a whole different thing. It is still the same uh, fluid, obviously, uh, but it's used uh, normally on the same day or, or thereabouts. Um, and it is it is gathered uh, um, from what is sometimes called a walking blood bank or an emergency donor panel, which are people that are pre-identified before um, as uh, potential donors. They then um, they're activated uh, during a time of emergency, perhaps a mass casualty scenario or a um, uh, you know a big big uh, battle. Um, or famously, uh, there's been a couple. Um, big uh, deliberate operations um, uh, that uh, some of the um, uh, more sort of uh, kicking down doors soldiers have done where they actually collected a whole bunch of uh, blood uh, on the morning of the operation and then went out and uh, kicked down all the doors and um, uh, and then th that was that was ready for, for, for that for that point. Fresh whole blood does contain all the components, including platelets. Um, you could argue that some of the platelets aren't going to work as well, but they are there and it's probably better than when they're stored. And there's 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 a more approximate uh, concentration of clotting factors to what is circulating in your body right now, I hope. Um, there is an important caveat with fresh whole blood that is slightly higher risk. Even if you test everyone before you deploy, even if you uh, are pretty confident with your testing um, there is still a, a risk and um, there have been uh, cases of uh, transmission um, of bloodborne viruses which um, which you know is obviously a drama um, so uh, so there's a bit of a risk benefit uh, thing there in the black box there I put low titer O whole blood um, as as the thing you're going to be reading about in the literature and I've deliberately kept in the American spelling um, because that is the because predominantly it's with the Americans that are putting out the literature about um, whole blood. We are starting to do that in the UK and other countries, um, but um, I, I, I am, I'm bilingual with uh, the Americans. Uh, there are uh, favorite colleagues um, uh, and, uh, and the, the, you will see this written a lot. Okay. Um, I've just put this picture. This is me and uh, a, a gang uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, the reason I put this here is to remind me that uh, you know, when you're, if your plan is to have fresh whole blood, you will have a panel of people who are all pre-tested and will be your blood donors. So the, you can see how this might be appealing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's ready, it's pre-tested and immediately available. Um, soldiers recover quickly. There have been some studies looking at uh, special forces operators who give a donor, they donate a, a bit of blood and then they see how fast they can run up a hill and all that sort of business. Uh, all very fun research, uh, but um, it does show that actually they can get back, back to fighting fitness pretty quick, even though they've just donated blood. Also, you're walking around on patrol with your, um, with your storage. You do not need a fridge. Uh, you do not need a logistic chain. Uh, they're all there and they're all carrying the blood around that, that, um, Hopefully you won't need, but uh, but you uh, but is readily available. There is a caution that I just mentioned about um, 
to do with the testing it's not just bloodborne viruses it's the antibodies it's all the stuff that's going to uh, um, potentially uh, cause a trouble um, if given uh, um, quickly so threshold blood this is a paper um, uh, from a war zone that uh, was kinetic um, I, I can't say where it was but uh, but basically the the emergency donor panel was was used multiple times 32 activations we're talking about hundreds of units of whole blood uh, used in this in this uh, area um, and um, so this is happening and this is being done and this is being used quite a bit both now and in the past in the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts um, and it is something that is um, popular for the military as you might imagine because of all those factors I just talked about and the uh, the fact that you don't need to carry around a refrigerator, you don't need to cycle uh, blood uh, in and out of the operating theatre um, and uh, in and out of the uh, theatre of war. So let's talk a bit about the evidence for whole blood in trauma. Now, um, there are so many studies that um, you could spend a long time just looking at the systematic reviews of all those studies. So I'm just going to go over the systematic reviews and, and, and would you believe it, all of these are systematic reviews um, that, that look at whole blood, normally comparing it to component, component therapy for trauma. And um, as you can imagine, the majority of these mix uh, military and civilian um, uh, 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 data. Just going to quickly look at this question. Can you clarify is type O, low titer, O negative and low titer for all the other antigens? Um, that is a good question. I might have to um, defer that till later. <laughs> um, it, it can be both of those and people are still working on the, the best combination uh, for, for donation. Right, so let's, let's kick this off. So 2020, uh, these authors um, looked at 12 different studies uh, looking at whole blood versus component therapy for trauma. And in their meta-analysis, they found no difference in outcomes between whole blood and component therapy. This was a mixed civilian and, uh, and uh, military study, uh, which also um, combined the, both the stored and fresh whole blood. It's a bit, um, a lot of the systematic reviews do combine these, these things, even though potentially you could, uh, you could argue they're different research questions, but, uh, but I guess they, they want to know about the biology and the physiology rather than the uh, logistics. Next paper um, uh, from um, uh, the uh, Ross Davenport's group uh, in London. They looked at um, six studies in 2020. Um, and again, they found no difference in outcomes between whole blood and component therapy. And um, this again was, was a mixed uh, picture. This paper um, was from, uh, from, from my group um, and we looked at only fresh whole blood. Okay, so only the, the donor panels and the walking blood bank. And it was mostly military studies. There were 27 studies we included but at, I think 26 were all from the military. Uh, and these were predominantly observational studies. They were all observational studies. What they tended to find was that um, uh, almost, well, all of the military papers were from Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. And um, all the outcomes were the same between whole blood and uh, component therapy, uh, except um, for one paper, which very clearly showed an, a, 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 um, a benefit in outcome benefit in mortality uh, with using fresh whole blood. Um, importantly, in, this, in these studies, even though there is an equivalent um, outcomes, the fresh whole blood tend to use fewer products. So in other words, um, you don't need as many components and you don't even need to store anything. So you can see how that's quite appealing from a, a military perspective because um, you know, of this, the, the whole logistic chain uh, is uh, importantly uh, taken out of the equation. It makes you more agile, uh, more able to fight um, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, fulfill the mission that you're, you're, you're supposed to be on. The important thing was we did also look for safety outcomes and um, there were one or two 
um, cases that were described in the literature um, of um, the transmission of bloodborne viruses. So uh, one or two cases in, in several thousand, um, you might argue, uh, well, you know, the risk benefit analysis, um, if you're a commander or you're a, um, you're a military a medic, um, you, you'd have to make up your mind about that. Later on, 2021, another um, systematic review again. There's so many of these systematic reviews that um, uh, there's a gap in the market for doing a, a systematic review of all the systematic reviews. So um, I know there's a few, I can see there's a few people I know that are quite keen on that sort of thing in the group. So, uh, so um, yeah, um, go for it. But um, this particular systematic review, again, found no difference between um, out in outcomes. And you're, you're beginning to see a pattern here, aren't you? This, uh, this systematic review just looked at civilian trauma. And again, you know, um, civilian trauma is, uh, is a very useful surrogate for military trauma. Um, you know, they're the same human beings, um, but um, it's just the difference in trauma burden. So these authors said that whole blood was safe and effective. And they said that within the pre-hospital domain, uh, it did show a reduction in mortality. Again, we're going back to uh, pre-hospital data for blood transfusion. Um, there have been no uh, published um, pre-hospital blood, whole blood trials, uh, but I am aware that um, some are underway. Uh, but in the, in the uh, pre-hospital studies so far of blood transfusion, um, uh, it looks as if there's probably uh, a benefit for patients for having pre-hospital blood, and it a lot depends on the uh, the the evacuation times and the severity of injury, etc. But again, that's um, perhaps for another presentation. So uh, later on, 2023, hot off the press. This is just July. Um, these authors again looked at the same question. Everyone loves this question, and they compared whole blood and components. Um, versus uh, components only. So these are patients that had components and then whole blood or whole blood then components versus those who had just had components alone. And the ones that had whole blood tended to have a better mortality. That's from 16 civilian trauma studies. So what is the summary? What's the bottom line of this systematic review of systematic reviews that one of you is going to write um, in the next few months? Um, well, the bottom line is that whole blood is safe and it's effective, and there is either no difference between in outcomes or there's a superior outcome uh, for whole blood versus component therapy. And that's important to uh, mention uh, next to the fact that you're using fewer products with less storage and less logistical um, constraints when you are using whole blood. So even when there is an equal um, outcomes or no statistically significant difference between outcomes, whole blood does represent a, an easier management for combat casualties. However, it doesn't matter how many systematic reviews you look at, um, or how many reviews of systematic reviews, if the primary studies that you include are all um, low evidence, low quality evidence, then the whole thing is low quality. So unfortunately, the vast majority of these studies are observational, um, very few randomized or prospective uh, studies. This is because um, the those uh, wars were um, were a, a you know a gold mine for data, and people wanted to um, produce descriptive studies, and um, so that's what we've got. That is what we have to work with so far, and and really you could say that's just hypothesis generating rather than um, hypothesis proving, and therefore um, I would uh, say that we should look closely towards the future uh, trials that are looking at whole blood versus component therapy. So we are talking about war. So a lot of the, those data were civilian trauma. Um, but war is, those of you in the military will know that the war of the past and Afghanistan is becoming increasingly historic. Um, we had uh, almost ideal circumstances. 
Bastion Field Hospital was probably the best hospital for trauma in the world uh, for many years. Um, but all the situation, uh, all the um, uh, all the environment was was right. We had complete air superiority, um, so helicopters could fly where they liked. And we could evacuate quickly. We had medics and doctors on the ground, um, uh, you know, treating patients at point of injury and all the good stuff you've read about um, in the past. However, we're now in a more uncertain present and future. We're in a, the era of um, contingency operations and the threat of a peer-to-peer -peer conflict. Um, and those of you who don't, don't know, know what that means, it means fighting people that are uh, the same capability as us. Um, rather than um, uh, people with uh, a machine gun and uh, a homemade bomb. So we all know about social media. This is Stonehenge on social media. <laughs> this is what Stonehenge is like in real life. Um, and the reason I'm showing this is because this is what, you know, uh, blood transfusion looks like in, in, uh, in, the, in the magazine or, you know, in, in a nice glossy journal. But this is what it looks like in real life. Um, and this is the domain in which uh, combat casualties are going to be uh, evacuated to and dealt with. So this is a reality check, really, about war transfusion, uh, war surgery. So on that topic, um, I recently had the privilege of working with um, David Knott, um, looking at some data he had from, from Syria. Um, looking at uh, what they had to do in these makeshift hospitals in uh, in the war-torn um, cities. And this is particularly uh, relevant now because we are entering an era where um, the these sorts of situations um, may be more and more common. Hospitals are not safe, it seems, um, and uh, we do need to uh, be careful about um, where we operate. So um, in Syria in 2013, they would use covert safe houses, underground facilities, essentially, and uh, patients would be transported um, in unmarked vehicles um, quick as they could. Uh, and um, the, they, were, they were arriving at the facility typically within five to 10 minutes, which is immense, really, um, if you think about it. I'm just going to quickly pause to look at the questions. Someone's up, Benjamin's asked, are these generally whole blood versus red blood cells and FFP or versus red blood cells, FFP and platelets? Yeah, the answer is that um, they have been uh, normally versus red blood cells and FFP. Uh, there are a few with platelets as well, but they're normally just FFP. Um, do I, this is from Stuart Mills. Do, do I think that there is a role for a deployable or frontline aphoresis capability within defence today? <sighs> yeah, I mean... Everything in defense is about um, logistics, about getting stuff forward, about um, resupply, about the people that are, that are trained and able to do this, uh, about technicians. So something that might seem relatively straightforward in a laboratory in the UK suddenly becomes a, a major nightmare in, um, in, uh, in the deployed field. So, um, so maybe <laughs> this is the vague answer to your question. I apologize. But just back to David Knott. So um, with, his, with his data, what they noticed was if the patient got to him within 10 minutes of injury, they didn't have the capability to give blood. So they just had fresh whole blood given by the mum or the dad or the brother or the uncle and given straight into the patient. But because they operated on the patient so quickly, they turned off the tap um, that the they were able to manage patients with a median HB less, less than we would ever consider in the UK. Uh, and you would consider these patients under transfused, really. But actually, if you turn off the tap and you give fresh whole blood, um, maybe, that is the, maybe that's the, um, the holy grail of trauma care. Um, but um, that comes with a thousand caveats about how quickly you can get patients to uh, the hospital, et cetera. But it's something to think about, isn't it? And uh, that's why I'm gonna come back to this, this slide, because if you stop the bleeding as your priority number one, and you give that hemostatic resuscitation and you target the physiology, it may not be, it may be that you don't need 
um, that high in HP, you know, the um, humans can survive on a very low HP. And as long as that oxygen carrying capacity can travel uh, to the microcirculation and oxygenate your end organs, if it can do that without bleeding out, without um, causing hypoxia and injury and further uh, damage, then um, you're going to be fine. And so that that's that's where we need to target. So it's not really about products. It's about getting those red, this getting the oxygen carrying capacity to where it needs to be. And for that, you need the other stuff. You need the non red stuff within your blood. So just quickly, this is um, a, a, a looking at the transfusion requirements. And again, so many studies that you only need to look at the systematic reviews. And, you know, we could go through all of these but they all say the same thing, which is that you can adequately, even in trauma, keep someone's HP a bit lower than you normally would expect. And as long as they're not coagulopathic, as long as they're warm, as long as they're not hypocalcemic or hyperkalemic, you do not need to worry as much about the HP. You just need to worry about getting those products to, um, to their end organs. So this study was a summary of 19 systematic reviews reporting 33 meta-analyses. So this is the Uber study. And generally speaking, it showed um, that most studies showed no difference between restrictive and liberal transfusion. And actually, some of the studies showed superior outcomes for restrictive uh, transfusion. So that's why I've got a Goldilocks um, slide. So there might be a sweet spot in transfusion where you don't want to give too much and you don't want to give too little, but somewhere in the middle, somewhere just right is going to be perfect. And as a hypothesis, um, that may be, to be somewhere between uh, seven and 10. Um, and you do not probably need to transfuse above 10. Um, and uh, again, subject to debate, but the evidence is out there, even for trauma. So, Let's not worry. We often worry about getting the red in because it's the color red. <laughs> we've got to get it in. But we've got to think about those other things. You've got to think about your physiological priorities and getting the oxygen carrying capacity to where it needs to get to rather than just providing more of it. OK, so I'd say stop the bleeding and do it as soon as possible. The reason I've got a car here is that some people say the best fluid for resuscitation is diesel because you've got to get the patients uh, to there as soon as possible. The next best is proline. Um, you've got to stop the bleeding. And then it comes to the whole blood. And although I love talking about blood and I could talk for hours, um, you've got to stop the bleeding. So I'm going to wrap it up because it's quarter to nine. So combat casualties can be big, sick. They're different to civilian casualties often, and not always, but um, we're talking about really sick patients. Whole blood may be close to the ideal trauma resuscitation fluid, but not because of the red bits, all right? It's, it's good because it has an oxygen carrying capacity, but it also prevents coagulopathy. It allows you to clot, um, and it provides all the other magic stuff that repairs the endothelial glycocalyx. Again, I'm not going to bore you with all that, but uh, you need to restore the lining of your microcirculation. You need to get the oxygen where it needs to get to, okay? But stop the bleeding at the earliest opportunity. And maybe if you stop the bleeding and you give a couple units of fresh whole blood, um, you can probably tolerate a lower HB and that might be the sweet spot. These are all hypotheses that need to be tested. Then finally, fresh versus stored whole blood is a risk benefit analysis um, that is uh, very important. And in the military, you must take into consideration the logistics because, um, you need to be agile. You need to be uh, surviving in austere, remote um, uh, uh, situations where there's going to be high impact um, kinetic activity. Uh, and therefore, probably fresh whole blood is, um, is favoured in, in many of those situations. And I'm going to wrap it up there and invite um, any questions, if that's right. Oh, there's already one here. Oh, gosh, there's a few. Right. I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll ramble on until you stop me. So given the data you've mentioned with outcomes following rapid DCS, how far forward do you feel is practical to have military surgery? Good question. Well, you know, um, 
The obvious answer is that it's a balance and that's a cop out. But you could have a surgeon in every patrol. You know, wh why, not put a, why not put a surgical team in every uh, group of six special forces uh, soldiers that are kicking down doors? Well, the reason you don't do that is because we don't have that many surgeons. Also, the further far forward you go, the fewer patients you can treat in one resupply and also the, the fewer resources you have. So you and also you begin to be, become a burden on the on the on the fighty soldiers. You start to become a burden uh, because um, you, you might be a, a, a 52 year old surgeon um, being dragged along with a bunch of 28 year olds who can run uh, 25 miles up the Brecon Beacons uh, without um, uh, without putting out their cigarette. So um, yeah, so that's uh, again it's a bit of a cop out, but there is a balance to be had. I wrote a paper about this, um, where do surgeons belong in the battlefield? Um, and the answer is, it's complicated. <laughs> oh dear, you love the cop-out scene. All right, uh, Omar says, with the threat of peer-to-peer -peer warfare, increasing gun knife crime in the UK, um, how can we join the gaps between civilian trauma care and military trauma care? That's a great question. Um, well, start by collaborating with, with each other. So military civilian collaboration is absolutely critical. And, um, you know, that's why I love working at the QE in Birmingham, because we are embedded within a military a unit and um, lots of people in uniform, um, lots of uh, cross talk um, between us and reading each other's literature and just working together is probably uh, the answer I could give to that. Bob Tipping, Bob, Tipping, Bob Tipping says, agree that red is not necessarily what combat casualties need, but what about our less physiological well patients? <sighs> yeah, I mean, ultimately that, so I've just noticed I'm getting darker and darker on the screen, but that's because the sun is rapidly going down. Um, we, we do need to get the red cells to our patients, correct? We do need to do it in a way that will provide them with oxygen, restore the oxygen debt, um, you know, stop them from uh, becoming hypoxic or having ischemic injury and multi-organ failure. Uh, but, but there is no good giving red blood cells to patients who cannot transport those red blood cells to their microcirculation. You know, it's like, um, it's like putting more water into a, a pipe that's, that's got leaks everywhere. Um, so it's, it is a balance. Um, and you just have to take each patient as they come. Can we extrapolate from these studies to medical hemorrhage? Um, no, <laughs> sorry. There, there's lots of work to do with medical hemorrhage. You know, there, there is, there's, um, you know, I bet you there's loads of um, systematic reviews about that as well. I, I haven't done a deep dive into that, although I'm a, a general surgeon, um, but, but um, I would I'd probably avoid that um, question for now, sorry. Paul says there's talk of this capability in Ukraine, um, but was there a need for it? Have you heard anything new? Uh, I need to answer that question offline, I'm afraid, sorry. Anonymous, do you think that there will be enough of a difference in outcomes between whole blood and component therapy to warrant having EDPs available to UK MTCs? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I, I think, hold on, I'm going to turn the light on in here. There we go, I'm back. Um, I don't think that in the UK, in the majority of MTCs, that that will be needed. We are very priv lucky, we're privileged to not have uh, the levels of devastating, penetrating trauma that is experienced in, in our, in our um, allied nations. Um, we don't have as many guns. We do have stabbings. We certainly have, have those uh, to a depressing degree, but um, I don't think there's gonna be a need for an EDP. Where the, that might change is if there is a massive shortage of blood. And um, I've uh, co-authored a, a WHO document about about you know preparedness for for blood transfusion in emergencies and also um i know that um john holcomb and, and some some of the americans have looked at at this um for you know for example during covid and uh, we the the levels of blood available in the country massively dropped and it was it was basically an emergency you know it might have seemed um 
okay but um, for those in the know it was a real disaster in in the in the um waiting to happen so it may be in in such situations that that might be required but i think in the normal uh, pattern of of um of trauma i don't think that's going to be needed in the uk jason how do you see the new technology changing potentially rapidly yeah logistics if not warm blood banking well everyone's working towards that you know it's a priority um closing the sophistication gap um getting uh, technology forward getting logistics sorted is is a major um, priority in defense um so people are working on that sorry I'll, I'll try and be rapid any changes future in your approach regard data coming from the current conflict in eastern europe um again i i uh i don't want to i i'm, I'm not, not i don't think i can answer that here what i can say generally is that where there is an austere environment that requires blood and you don't have it then that is where you need to seriously think about a fresh whole blood uh, walking um blood bank or an emergency donor panel which may or may not be uh, useful in uh, to our colleagues in the far east uh, bob tipping can nhsbt provide whole blood or do they only issue components um at the moment in the mainstay 99.9% .9 of what they issue is components um but that is changing and there are others online who would be better answering that question uh because i know certainly not in the west midlands but um perhaps in london um that might be uh something closer um in time than than what we might expect in, in the rest in the rest of the country uh right <laughs> What's the ballpark timeline to be able to take a unit of blood from someone do the basic testing yeah um so people have tested this you know we're talking about a quickest time um you know in less than half an hour um you know you can do it really quickly if you're if you're really switched on you've got it all set up and um people people can do it quickly and they're, they're really trained to do that what's the shelf life that you'd be happy to use it for bearing in mind that the white cells are still functioning helps in preventing infection yeah, so fresh the questions about fresh whole blood at, um stored at room temperature I, I i don't i haven't seen anyone looking specifically at, at the deterioration in fresh whole blood I'm, I'm happy to be corrected um but um normally it cannot be used in less than in more than 24 hours that tends to be um the uh the the sort of rules I mean, even 24 hours is really stretching it rob faulkner uh, what's the incident of lto in the military in smaller deployments of difficult logistic trains where full threshold blood would be useful do we know how many donors there might be uh what is the instance of i'm not sure i don't know the answer to that um but i do think that in smaller deployments if you do not have a chain of a cold chain from donor to point of injury then you know the so we seem to have uh lost him <laughs> uh hopefully he joins back in um to answer the rest of your questions uh they all look they all sounded very very interesting and the ones that are left uh look very interesting if he doesn't uh get back on we can uh get these questions sent in an email to him and uh he should be able to reply to you that way um thank you for everyone who has attended this webinar um, I do have the rest of the trauma care slide. Uh, if you enjoyed this webinar, please come to our next one, which is leadership lessons, 10 things I wish I knew, I'd known earlier in my career. So obviously this can also apply not only to the trauma medical field, but to any medical, any field really. Um, it won't be me facilitating, you'll get the usual Anna, because uh, I'm 
on annual leave, somewhere sunny apparently, not this rainy country. Um, if you're not a member, um, but you want to keep attending our webinars and get certificates uh, without paying, please join. Um, if you're not a member, please scan our QR code on the screen and it will take you straight to the form to fill in for your portfolio. Um, if you can't figure out the QR code or it doesn't work, please email admin at traumacare.org.uk and we'll get it sent across to you. And these webinars would not be possible without our sponsors and our biggest sponsor um, is Qualsafe. Um, they're our first aid sponsor and they have lots and lots of courses. Um, definitely check them out on the website or you can use a QR code on screen. Galen, another one uh, that's a great sponsor. Um, they're always at our conferences. They're going to be at the surgery study day as well. So if you have any questions for them, please do ask them. Icarus, um, also a great sponsor um, who, although haven't been to any of our conferences this year, they do have a lot to say um, to help improve trauma care. And another one is World Extreme Medicine. They're always at our conferences. And David's back. Um, oh, sorry. I do, I do apologise. I, I got booted yeah. up. Uh, was it like the Oscars when uh, the music starts playing um, and uh, <laughs> you have to finish? Um, yeah, so uh, you can finish the questions if you like. No, no, no. I, I, I you know, the um, I, I'm conscious that it's uh, time is going on, but um, I, I, I've really enjoyed um, interacting with everyone. I'll just quickly have a look at. Oh, uh, no open questions. Okay. There is. There's. Um... Oh, I, I can't see it on mine. Maybe oh, it's... it might be because you've been out. So um, somebody has asked, uh, there was a question about the temperature of the shelf life that you'd be happy to use it for, uh, bearing yeah. in mind that white cells are still functional and helping to prevent infection or bacterial contamination. Yeah, it's got, I mean, you know, you've got to give it within a few hours and 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 definitely not, not more than 24 hours. Um, there, there will be different guidance for different, um, uh, you know, appetites for risk shall we say um uh but uh, but same day it's got to be yeah and rob asks what is the oh sorry i'm dyslexic i'm not sure about this world um incidents of the lto in the military in oh, smaller deployments with difficult logistic chains where fwb would be useful do we know how many doctors there might be yeah, I don't I don't know um, the answer to that. But I, what I do know is that in smaller units that are more agile and more aust in more austere environments, that fresh whole blood is going to be more and more attractive um, than stored whole blood. Um, you know, you, you need stored whole blood needs a, a cold chain from donation, probably in the UK, to be honest, if for UK troops moving out to um, to the front line. And if you can't facilitate that, you just need fresh whole blood. And Fleming Hansen asks. Does WB transfusion have a role in prolonged field care in a pre-hospital setting without a surgical capacity? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question. It probably does, but, you know, this comes back to my pet peeve that, you know, it doesn't matter how much blood you give someone. If you cannot stop the bleeding, um, then there's no good. So as long as you can get your first stop the bleed operation done, give the patient some whole blood, and then and then keep them there or perhaps evacuate them on a train um, over you know 600 miles um, as might become relevant in future wars then that's fine as long as you've stopped the stop the bleeding if you've stopped the bleeding and you've given some fresh whole blood and you've looked after the physiology such as coagulopathy the cal calcium the potassium all that good stuff if your HB is a little bit low, then you don't need to worry about it, you know, and I don't think I would, I wouldn't be a proponent 
in a setting where you have limited resources to keep topping up that HB if all the other things are fine and the patient is physiologically okay and they're repaying their oxygen debt, which is entirely possible with low HPs. Yeah. And Kay Rutherford asks, if the donors are screened for BBV, why is the fresh donation still considered high risk of spreading disease? Um, I mean, I could be flippant and say, have you ever met a soldier? But I'm not going to be flippant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the timing is um, so imp this is important. At the, the, when you test the blood, the blood then remains in the patient until it's then given. So there's still a risk. When you test a donated unit of blood, it is no longer in a patient, it's no longer in a human being. So, you know, the, there are zero chances of, of, of a bag of blood uh, contracting HIV. There is a above zero chance of a, of a young Royal Marine doing that. So does that make sense? Sorry, Royal Marine. It makes Marine. sense to me, and I I'm not medical <laughs> at all. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, Pleasure. Even with your Oscar moment. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's all right. Um, I just need to finish this slide for our viewers. Um, if I can get it to work, it's my own. Oh, no. And we've got lots of academic partners uh, who are the University of Wolverhampton, UCLan, who have only just signed, which is great, um, the University of Gloucester and the University of Sunderland, um, where we have all of the paramedic science students, members of our charity. Um, and of course, pro trainings. Thank you for coming to tonight and we hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you have better weather than what we've been having the past couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for um, the invitation as well. Of course. Thanks. And then we hope you come again. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.